Hi, I'm James Schillinglaw for Virtual Roadshows, Selling Cruise Vacations, and also Insider Travel Report. And we're here doing uh, panels with major cruise suppliers. Uh, and, you know, you're going to get to see every, every category in cruising. And today we have three great expedition cruise operators. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to be on uh, many of their ships. So I, I'm, I'm very pl pleased to introduce them. So let's talk, let's, let's tell you exactly who we have on the panel now. We have, and please raise your hand when I mention, for Atlas Ocean Voyages, we have Tim Birch, who's the Central Regional Sales Director for Atlas Oceans. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? We're good. And not to confuse Tim's, but for Silver Sea, we have uh, Tim Am who's the expedition director. Uh, say hi, Tim. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. And uh, for Panon, we have Ellen McElvain, who's the director of business development for Panon. Hello, Ellen. Hi. Thank you, James. Nice to see you. Absolutely. Now, nice to see you guys. And uh, and you all have appropriate backdrops, uh, except for me. And and uh, yeah, you see, Tim, we we have our old our. Uh, this isn't a real backdrop for. I should have put my expedition cruise backdrop, but but it, then I'd have to say who it was. But I don't want to. And I've since I've been on a yeah, number of your lines. Uh, in fact, I think I've been on almost all of your lines. Uh, so uh, so let's get right to it. And uh, first off, I want each of you to tell briefly describe your company, including the number of ships and kind of where you go. And we're going to start with you, Ellen. Uh, uh, what about Panam? Uh, how many ships do you have, and where do you go? All right. Thank you. So Ponon is a boutique luxury expedition travel company. So we specialize in expedition cruises to remote and less less travel destinations. Um, we're really known for providing an upscale and intimate travel experience. So our guests come to Ponon and they return for that combination of adventure and elevated comfort, I would say. Um, also for the sustainability component, that's the big piece of who we are and why people travel with us. Um, but at present, we have 12 ships sailing in the Penant fleet. We made an announcement in early July about our next vessel. So planning is underway for that. It's a hundred stateroom sailing ship will be a new concept, completely carbon neutral, but very futuristic looking at the renderings. That said, delivery is a few years off. So for the purpose of our advisor partners who are listening in on this panel, Panat has 12 ultra modern expedition yachts in our fleet. We travel to all seven continents. So wherever there's a ocean shore to be explored, you can likely find Panat in the vicinity at some point in the year. Absolutely. And uh, let's move to you, Tim Birch uh, from Atlas Ocean. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, and, and Atlas is growing. So uh, you, you tell us how many ships you have and, and how many to come and also where you go. We are growing, James, for sure. Uh, yes, uh, Atlas Ocean Voyages, actually, uh, we built our first ship in 2019. That's the uh, World uh, Navigator. But obviously, she didn't start sailing until 21, I believe it was. And then the World Traveler just uh, came out last year fall in in november but i'm excited to to announce that we actually have another vessel coming online november 1st we're taking delivery of another uh yacht on november 1st and then we have one in the shipyard for august of next year and then one for 24 or 25 and one for 26 wow so you yeah. are you're, you're gonna so be we are, we are growing we are growing. I, I was actually on the navigator when it first launched uh in fact it wasn't even a real cruise it was the owner's cruise for about nine days across uh across the med so that was interesting to, to experience that ship at the very start and looking forward to getting back there to see what you've done on some of these other ones and you get great itineraries and uh let's let's move to the other tim on the panel tim m uh who is at silver sea talk a little bit about uh your fleet and uh and the company as a whole yeah uh, as, as a whole um <clears throat> you know silver seas used to be a, a privately owned company uh a few years ago we are fully incorporated into the royal caribbean group uh, which, which for us is, has also been uh, an incredible sort of transition, but but introduction uh, to to let's call it bigger corporate environment. We have five uh, expedition ships uh, dedicated at the moment, and then seven in the classic fleet. So I know not necessarily uh, super relevant for for this conversation. Uh, the the Silver Nova coming out, and then uh, her sister ship a little bit later on this. Uh, well, in the the beginning of next year. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the luxury cruising segment, we, we have the most berths uh, of any company operating in, in that space. Uh, as, a, as a brand, we go to over uh, 900 destinations uh, around the world. You know, we've got the, the dedicated uh, Silver Origin and the Galapagos, um, you know, but, but 
yeah, in, in terms of a global footprint, I, I don't know, and I'd, I'd have to be fact checked by my my panel of uh, uh, my colleagues here. But uh, you know, we, it's it's often said that we go to to almost twice as many um, destinations as our, our nearest luxury competitor. Uh, I know within the expedition space, uh, there there are a number of other companies that that visit a huge number of destinations as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's been uh, an, an incredible journey being being part. Sorry, and I, I know this isn't entirely part of the question, but I, I was with Silver Seas, uh, you know, as a as a privately owned company, and uh, that that transition into Royal has has really been an interesting uh, sort of financial injection with with the focus on on new ships. You know, we've added four in the last two years, um, and and obviously another one coming out in in the next few weeks. So really exciting. No, absolutely. And all of all three of you are considered in the luxury sphere of expedition cruise lines, which is kind of interesting. Uh, now let's uh, go to you, Tim, and, and let's talk about what is luxury expedition cruising today? What 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 constitutes that? Sorry, is, is that staying with me? That, that would be Tim. I'll go to Tim Birch and then we'll come back okay. to you. I have to I, have, I should always say the last name on these, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, actually, luxury cruising in in we appeal not only to the luxury uh, guests, but also to the premium guests. So we cover both, both avenues there, but uh, you know, luxury uh, with, with Atlas ocean voyages, obviously we're all inclusive. Uh, everything is included, including our uh, shore excursions, our land excursions, things of that nature. So that's kind of uh, our culinary program. What we call our Epicurean program is just out of this world. It's something that, uh, uh, we just started and uh, it's going really, really well. But I would have to say more. It's the it's the staff on board, our our vessels. They're they're fantastic. Uh, the the hardware itself, the ships are absolutely the yachts are beautiful, and uh, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, but uh, I I would have to say luxury is uh, definitely um, with with the ships themselves. I mean the yachts are absolutely beautiful. You know, and they and, and all of you have some very new new uh, tonnage out there. It's amazing, uh, and I've been on a lot of them now. And you mentioned culinary, which is key to all of your your yeah. products. Mm -hmm. uh, and and Tim M, same thing. I mean, what 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 makes yeah. for luxury expedition cruising today? And you know, you you would repurpose some of your silver sea ships into expedition ships, and then of course you launched the first of a, a brand new uh, luxury line, which I was happy to be at the christening of in Antarctica with uh, silver endeavor uh but what makes yeah. luxury expedition today yeah it, it's actually a when when I, I thought about this question i actually googled it i wanted to see if there was a, a generic answer for, for what this is because I, I feel like the industries uh come to this interesting place where the the term is being thrown around quite a lot and and what it actually means is you know i i started with silver seas in 2008 when we launched uh, prince albert ii and and, uh, you know, that was sort of the, the pinnacle at, at the time of, of what luxury expedition cruising was. You know, there was almost this uh, this industry wide within the expedition industry, like, oh, you can't combine the two. Um, and, and it's been interesting to see how the, the brands transition. You know, I think we're the first people to introduce the, the butler service and the caviar and the, the, the champagne and that all inclusive sort of concept you know i think in the last few years particularly pre-pandemic was was all about new ships and I, I i don't mean the term lightly but some of the gadgets and things that that have been coming on on board um yeah i think that there's a little bit more of a, an industry-wide centric focus back onto the actual actual expedition delivery and, and the products and and what that means in terms of the quality of the the guides the experience the number of sort of guests to zodiac guests to staff that experience ashore um, as a broader sort of understanding i think as, as silver seas you know understanding them as, a, as our parent company it, you know luxury has been more on the affluence as opposed to the opulence side of, of how we we define things uh, you know i can only echo tim's tim's comment it's, it's definitely about that level of service uh you know that the onboard the onboard offering that attention to detail that you're getting from the butler and the and the bartender and and that cultural of hospitality uh you know i think coming from such a a, a steeped and in and, and, and rooted brand in that luxury space naturally just carries on through to the, that expedition in, environment and and the care and the attention you know of, of the entire team that that have to come together in, in the operation of these in, in incredible trips um, you know, I, I always laugh, you know, like maybe sometimes seven pillow choices isn't enough. And it's it's that eighth <laughs> one that's really going to make you feel like you, you're you at home and, and having the best possible experience. Um, you know, I, I think from from an industry-wide 
perspective, there's there's constantly been this this evolution amongst the different brands of I don't I don't want to say it un- neg- negatively, but like one upmanship, like oh we're doing this now and we're doing doing that. I think you know have, having pioneered the, the industry and and being part of the the original sort of uh, evolution of that. I, I think it's 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 drawing on these two things of the the onboard level of service. You know we we all recognize. In, in some of these destinations, you're spending, you know, 70% of your time on the ship. So you want to have that luxury platform. And, you know, as, as you mentioned, the, the Endeavor, the, the most expensive expedition ship uh, built to my, to my understanding, you know, offering that service on board, but transferring that ashore into a true expedition experience and, and not skimping on the, on the benefits of, of being in these destinations and spending yeah. time off the ship with the experts. No, absolutely, and and I I have been on the Endeavor, and I've been, and I also, but I've also been on uh, Commandant Charcot, which uh, Ellen has, and and that I thought was a revolutionary move in 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 expedition river cruising, uh, river cruising, expedition cruising. I'm already on my previous panel. That's not good. Um, let let's talk about uh uh Ellen, what you think expedition cruising is today, and how it's evolved. Yeah, thanks. So it's interesting hearing, you know fellow commentators, because we're all sort of in this mix together, right? And looking, what are you doing? What are they doing? Um, I think for for Penant, expedition is the way that the travel is done, right? Like we use our ships for both classic cruising as well as expedition cruising. And there are a few things you really expect to see on an expedition if you ways you're traveling. Um, Tim mentioned Zodiacs, right? That's definitely a part of it. Um, you're exploring and it's it's just fun, right? We all know that. We've all been on expeditions. It's so fun when you're in that environment and the zodiac. You're you're seeing the world where you are as it actually is, and I promise you, nobody's looking at their phone when they're on a zodiac, right? Like this is why people come back and back to expeditions. And there's a lot of really amazing expedition companies, and more coming in for a good reason. It's a really meaningful and a fun way to travel, and people love it. But the luxury piece. For us, the luxury piece is the comfort. And I think luxury in expeditions, really, it's quite interesting to think about because as travel advisors and, you know, as people in the economy, a lot of the time we look at luxury as like a limiting factor. Luxury is associated with a higher price point. It's exclusive and special. And sometimes like part of the reason it's so special is not everybody can do it. Um, In the case of expedition cruising, when you add that luxury piece to the expedition, this actually opens up this niche, right? It's available and enjoyable to even more people. And so, I mean, I've worked on expedition ships. I know like not everyone (laughs) would be eager to book, uh, not one that would fit in with any of the brands that are here today. Um, And and even so, this was before my time at Penang, but you know, an expedition is, it's a significant spend for most travelers, whether it's luxury or not. Um, I often think back to a trip that I was working on around Papua New Guinea. Um, I was part of the expedition team. So again, prior to Ponan and on the expedition side, we were like crushing it. It was so good. We were snorkeling with these huge groups of manta rays. We were visiting these remote communities that hadn't had visitors in like five or more years. And our guests there, they were amazed. They were being taken by the hand of local kids on the schools. It was amazing. But when we got home, I heard from a few travel advisors that their guests didn't like it. Mm. And I'm thinking, how, (laughs) like, how is that possible? But I came to find out like their air conditioning was broken in a few rooms. They didn't have balconies to get the fresh air. They weren't sleeping well. It's a 12, 16 hour time change, right? They were never rested. They didn't really like the food all that much. So they never got comfortable. They never right. like set down their emotional travel baggage that like makes people bicker in airports. We all see people coming on board, like ready to sit down and enjoy. Right. But if they're, you know, and let's be honest, like I think we all know nobody goes to Antarctica for the thread count, right? That's like not why people are booking these <laughs> trips. But well, 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 on all of your ships, I do actually, but that's another. I mean, our thread <laughs> count is amazing. I sleep so well on Punan but we're going for mother nature. But if you're sleeping well and you're eating well and you're not doing math in your head about how much did I pay for this versus what am I getting, right? You're more available for that expedition moment. And that is the beauty of this luxury expedition combination. More people want to do it and more people that do it are really enjoying it. 
So that I think is the difference with a luxury expedition. Well, let's go, let's go to the next question. I'm going to go to you, Tim Birch. Uh, uh, obviously all three brands here are in that premium of the luxury uh, expedition cruise space. Uh, uh, how, how are travel advisors supposed to determine the best fit uh, for their client? You know, what should they consider uh, given that there are really an increasingly number of choices in the market today. Uh, what are your thoughts, Tim? Well, I believe, first of all, to piggyback on Ellen's comment about, you know, we not only do Antarctica and the Arctic, but, you know, we do go to the Med and, and Northern Europe also. And, uh, um, and that's where we re really put in our Epicurean program. That's where we lead that off to be. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, as far as Atlas Ocean Voyages, you know, obviously we're not a household name, um, but we rely on our travel partners to really uh, sell the product. And I believe that, uh, uh, you know, our our loyalty factor on board our our vessels from our from our guests, uh, they continue to come back. But at the end of the day, you know, it's really about it's about the vessel. In my opinion, it's about the size of our vessels, our yachts, and again, the service on board, the culinary program, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's really all about that. Um, but uh, I think we're pretty diverse. Again, I think with everybody on the panel, we're pretty diverse. Whereas, uh, again, with the destinations that we focus on, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's uh, I think that's a, a good draw, especially and with, with Atlas, definitely a draw. So you look at destinations as one of the yeah, things you should look absolutely. at. And, uh, Tim, I have the same question about, you know, you, there are some great products here. There are even more, you know, out there. And it's it's almost, you know, used to say, OK, I, I know there are expedition fleets and there's not that many of them and I'll make a choice. And now in, in just the last few years, the number of expedition cruise ships has grown. I mean, obviously, it's still never going to fit into a Royal Caribbean uh you know, oasis of the seas or whatever, but it's still a lot more than we had, and certainly in the upscale area and the premium, premium and luxury. But what, what do you think? How should travel advisors approach this to make a decision about what fits best for their client? Yeah, no, perfect. Um, I, I mean, I think it's it's really a, a two prong approach, and there, there's understanding your client and and their needs and wants is, is an important component because you know as you as you acknowledge there there are a number of different players in the industry, but uh, I, I think understanding your client and then understanding the companies and, and what their pros and cons and, and benefits are. You know, I, I kind of see it, and I, I don't know if, if it's a, a, a linear graph or, or whatever it is, but there, there's different quadrants. You know, you have companies that, that are more on the luxurious side of things. There's companies that maybe focus a little bit more on the, on the expedition side of things. Then there's the, the cost equation that, that needs to come into it. You know, they're, they're, they're all positioned onto this this chart, whatever you want to, to, to see it. And, you know, that's, that's where understanding, I, I think your, 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 your client, you know, I, 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 I've heard this a number of times and um, I, I really love the analogy. We have the guests on board for, for 10 days or however long the journey is, but the, the, the agents are responsible for that lifetime of the client. And, you know, it, they, they could book two years out and, and, and work with those clients for you know a really long uh, time before they actually even get get on board right. the, the platform. So their their role and their their function in, in servicing, understanding, meeting the needs and expectations of those guests are important. Um, you know the 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 client's journey throughout their their trip. You know the as an agency, you've you've gone through the hard work, you've you've earned their trust and respect, and and you want to to be able to foster a relationship. Uh, with, with your clients so that they come back and repeat, you know, I, I think uh, up, up until they pass the the top, uh, so it's Silver Seas Repeat Society, it's called the Venetian Club, um, you know, our, our top Venetian society member, I think had over 1,800 days um, before they passed away, which is which is an incredible thing, but, uh, you know, and understanding the the products, understanding the the support that you're going to have on the back end, you know, again, and I I, I like to mention it because it, I think it is incredibly important. You know, Royal Caribbean stepped in and, and guaranteed uh, you know the agents commissions and everything during the, the entire COVID period, which I think was an incredible thing to do. So, being understanding the the companies, how they deliver the product, understanding the the organization that's background supporting that product is, is super important understanding the client's needs and wants and you know 
we, we all know if you go on a ship of more than 500 passengers down to Antarctica, you're not even getting off the ship. So it's yeah. about, well, if, if your client doesn't even want to get off a ship, that's fine. But if, if you're not managing or meeting and understanding those, those needs and expectations of the client, then, then you're doing a disservice to them and, and you're not representing the brand well either. No, absolutely. Now, Alan, I'll give you the last uh, word on this in terms of how do, how do you how do you decide which of these of your products and which of the products in the market uh, you should book for your clients? I mean, obviously, you're going to talk to the client and find out, but it, it's becoming a little more confusing than in the old days because uh, there wasn't as much there wasn't as much choice, and now there is a lot. Yeah, no, I certainly echo what Tim and Tim have said. Um, there's a lot going on in the market. We're all, we've all got all these different scatter charts. Um, I would say, you know, to the advisors who are, I, I would say if you have the opportunity to go on an expedition, like invest in the time and yourself. Um, and we know you can't go on every expedition cruise line, I guess, like, unless you're James Schillinglaw, then maybe you can. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> But if you go, even if you under you experience an expedition, it's going to give you a foundational understanding of what an expedition is offering, and it'll inform you so you know what questions to ask, right? So I, this we said earlier, you know, at the top, expedition cruising is becoming this kind of vague term, and if you go and experience, you'll have more concrete things. You'll, you'll know to ask how many people are on board. You'll right. know to say how many people are in a Zodiac. You'll know to say, does everybody go out at one time? You'll know the value of having a private balcony or how many people are on the expedition team. And that will kind of help you orient yourself. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, use a resource that, you know, at Panon, our business development team, they're, we want to give you clear information. Right. We will right. help you make the right decision about who is, you know, find the Panant client, not just throw Panant at, at everything, although you could do that as well. But, you know, we'll work with you in an honest and individual way. Now, uh, we've talked earlier about um, the destinations, and obviously everybody focuses in, on Antarctica and the Arctic, um, sometimes in some cases, not for all your companies, Galapagos. Uh, these are expedition destinations we all know. But the fact is that all of you go to a lot more than that. Uh, talk, talk a little bit of, or highlight some of those other destinations that you think really are great expedition cruise destinations uh, that, uh, you know, a travel advisor should consider for their clients. I'm going to start with you, Tim Birch. Well, hot off the press, actually, literally three hours ago. But let me talk first about, um, you know, our, 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 our med sailings, you know, our Europe sailings. But we just announced literally, like I said this morning, that now we're going to be doing bonus areas to Rio. Uh, we're going to do some Caribbean departures now, which we haven't done in the past. So some St. Martin, we're going to do uh, uh, what, some Lisbon uh, to London. So we've added on about, I believe it's 26 new itineraries to our uh, to, to, to our calendar. So that's pretty exciting in my opinion. So no, absolutely. It, and it is, and that you can have this experience expedition. And, and in your case, you had a lot of Epicurean cruises too. Right. And that's what you've been focusing on, especially this summer, uh, that you can actually enjoy an expedition cruise to other places than just the uh, snow and the ice in the mountains, which are gorgeous. Believe exactly. me, I've been to both destinations, Arctic and Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, but there are so many more destinations for expedition cruising. Uh, 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 Tim M, tell a little about some of those other places that you, you go, uh, even in your expedition cruising. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know you mentioned the Galapagos uh, as, as a destination, but from, from the advisor's perspective, uh, one, one sort of comment that I'd like to bring about that is I think it's it's the the sort of quintessential introduction to expedition cruising. It's at least from from the the perspective of this panel, it's a North American market. It's pretty easy accessible. It's right. a seven day turnaround, and right. it's just such a great multi generational destination. You know, it, it's grandma to grandkids, and the, and there's something for everyone to do. So I, I don't want to 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 skip over that. I think if you're trying to build your book of business and introduce people to this concept of expedition cruising, it, it can be a far easier or less daunting sale uh, than, than a, a trip to Papua New Guinea or the Solomons or, or, or something like that. Right. Um, right. One of the other areas that I I, I mean it's it's I, I spent ten years as expedition leader on on the ships uh, for Silver Sea, so uh, I, I've 
been very, very privileged to, to travel and, and see a lot of the world. Um, but the Kimberley, uh, the, the northwestern part of Australia, is a spectacular region. In, in my mind, it covers uh, a, a true expedition destination. As, as much as going down to Antarctica is, it's, it's remote, it's wild. Uh, you know, obviously, it's hot as opposed to cold, but uh, the, the scenic beauty of it, the, the exploration aspect of zodiac cruising and hiking and, and the wildlife, it, it really is quite incredible. You know, I, I, uh, I was, was incredibly lucky to, to visit Scoresbysund, uh, you know, the East, East Greenland National Park, uh, mm -hmm. the, the world's largest fjord system. And that was a, a once in a lifetime trip. I, I couldn't think of anything about that. You know, we, we do the Northwest Passage, we've done Northeast Passage. Unfortunately, obviously, Russia's not, not a, currently a, a destination that we're, we're sailing to, but, you know, we had a great Sea of Okoska itinerary in the Russian Far East. Uh, and then there's the whole South Pacific, you know, I, I, I hate to admit it, but I, I've probably forgotten more of the island's names than, than I remember. <laughs> but, you know, Tuvalu and Tokelau and, you know, going to the Yap Islands and all of those incredible destinations in the South Pacific. You know, obviously there's the, the Papua New Guineas and the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, French Polynesia, like the, the standard destinations. But that whole part of the world has so much to offer with just thousands of, of unique remote islands, destinations and, and visitation. Uh, as I say, we're, we're very fortunate, or I'm, I'm very fortunate to represent a brand that that has so many yeah, destinations are, are around the world. And, and one thing I, I do want to point out, and you know, obviously with, with my other panels here, it's, it's a similar comment. You know, expedition cruising isn't only in these remote parts of the world. You know, uh, the Norwegian fjords is an incredible small ship expedition destination to visit. And, and you just see it so differently. I remember a few years ago, I was on, uh, I think, uh, the Silver Explorer in, in Alaska. And I, I don't know, it was maybe Holland America or one of the big ships went, went cruising past us. And we were out in our Zodiacs with hundreds of humpback whales all around the vessel. <laughs> and they might have been, you know, 10 of their guests on their balconies. But, but they're so inwardly focused that they were missing the experience of being in these destinations. And, you know, visiting these, these incredible destinations around the world on the smaller ship just allows for so much more of an intimate experience and in, in, in exploration. Absolutely. And it is, it, I think we have to remember there are so many other places to visit and go expedition cruising. Uh, Ellen, I'll give you a chance here and talk about some of the other destinations uh, that you offer. I mean, you know, you, one, of, one of your ships uh, and, and going back to the Arctic actually goes to the North Pole, which was very interesting. One of the ships that I was on, I didn't do that cruise, but it's a beautiful ship, but you do the North Pole. But some of the, what are some of the other destinations that maybe we don't think about as much when, uh, beyond Arct Arctic and uh, Antarctic? Yeah, certainly. Um, I love listening to the other panelists too, because I'm thinking, oh yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's such a good, I mean, expedition is, it's so good when it's done right. It's so fun. Um, people just absolutely enjoy it. One that I think is a little different that um, Penant's offering that at least piqued my interest um, we're offering expeditions in the subtropical islands of Japan. So these are kind of new itineraries carefully created by our, my colleague Rio, who is um, uh, Japanese, one of our expedition leaders. So we'll be operating those in the spring of 2024. And they'll start in the southern Japanese city of Fukuoka, and then they'll go down to Taiwan. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a different thing, right? Like a, if you have a guest who's been everywhere, here's an opportunity to explore some really different ecosystems, so many endemic species, and we'll offer diving on those itineraries. So again, it doesn't have to be, you don't think of expedition in Japan, but it's offering a different way of travel. Expedition is isn't no longer just going somewhere super remote. As Tim said, it's how we travel. There's, right. I went yeah. on a walk in my neighborhood with one of our expedition guides and it blew my mind. I was like, <laughs> how did I not see all this stuff, right? It's the way that you can experience nature and, and, and culture in a Different way. And absolutely, your expedition team. And, uh, and I want to get to that point. And the next question involves it. Uh, uh, you know, how important is that expedition team to an expedition cruise? And I'll start with uh, you, Tim Birch. I mean, how important is your expedition team to the real experience you get on board? I believe it's paramount, without a doubt. I, our expedition team is fantastic just along, I'm sure, with everyone else on the panel, but it's just absolutely paramount. And that's what I hear from my travel advisors when I talk to them about it. They come back and they say that their clients just were blown away by the expedition team. Mm -hmm. um, they're the ones that make it happen. You know, we have we have beautiful yachts. You know, we have great service on board. We got great Epicurean program, culinary program. But at the end of the day, 
the expedition team absolutely has to deliver. And I think they do that for sure with Atlas, without a doubt. Absolutely. And it is important. And uh, I'll go back to you, Alan, a little bit again. Same question. How important is that expedition team uh, to the experience? I mean, yeah, it's essential. I think we would all agree it's not an expedition without the expedition team, right? It's typically 10 to 15 amazing guides who are maybe specialists. There's usually a marine biologists and an ornithologist, right? There's all these different expertise. What they're bringing is, is that experience of education and, and understanding a world by experiencing it. But it's not just when you're on the tour or when you're on the excursion, you're dining with them, you're socializing, nope. they're out on deck, right? It's this participatory conversation that lasts the entirety of the expedition. Um, and it wouldn't be an expedition without the team. And certainly our team, our team is amazing as well. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because uh, all of your teams are wonderful and I've been on a lot of the ships and it is amazing. And Tim, you, you Tim M, you're, you, you've actually run these teams. I mean, what do you tell these guys to tell them to be so on all the time about all their knowledge and sharing? And, you know, they got to be on pretty much all the time to, to be with the guests, uh, both on the ship and dining with them and then taking them off the ship to different uh, expeditions. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, uh <laughs> Slight, slight sort of personal note. I actually met and married my wife on board. She was one of the ologists, Ellen. <laughs> so, you know, you that's obviously there the best go. people on the ship is, <laughs> is, is the standard. But um, yeah, I mean, on, on our, our, our bigger ships, I mean, we have up to 28 expedition staff. Um, you know, I think there's, yeah, and, and, and we can all recognize there, there is um, a certain amount of loyalty, but expedition staff move throughout the industry. You know, they want to go to new destinations and things like that. So I, I think understanding the, 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 the importance of them is, is, is obvious. But, um, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, just a slight, slight different spin on it. I think, you know, we've got three dedicated uh, office-based staff that are, are there for, um, you know, the, the pure focus of developing, training, onboard, uh, and, and sort of a self-education beyond the role of expedition staff, you know, uh, Silver Seas and, and with our, our parent Royal has really identified them as, as one of the core facets of delivering these, these incredible experiences. You know, we have over, uh, it's about 40 annual staff uh, who are employed that work both on the ship and, and on the ships. I think, uh, you know, our, our pool of, of staff is in the region of about 260 that are, you know, specialists in their specific part of the world and, and where, they, where they are. And I think one of the other sort of components, um, and, and, and this is just really an encouraging sign and, and something that I've seen, the improvements um, you know, from, from having been a, a privately held company to, to now being part of a, a much larger uh, organization and seeing the investment in the equipment um, and the resources that are available to the staff to, to be the best they are. You know, I, th I think you said that. How, how can we get the best out of our teams on board and uh, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's not just the, the shore side, it's the dining and all of the experiences yeah. and, and making sure that we're supporting the teams in their, in their own and interpersonal and, and, and independent growth. Uh, and, and then I, I think having a whole bunch of new destinations is really something that, that keeps people interested and excited. I, I, we used to have uh, sort of lists that people would sign up when we'd launch a new itinerary, like, Oh, I want to go there. Can I be a, a part of that trip or, or go to this region? Um, so I think that, that is, is also an incredible part of, of keeping, maintaining, and, and, and fostering talent within the team. Absolutely. And indeed, uh, the, when the teams teams really want to go someplace and they're kind of doing it, they're, they're looking for destinations that they haven't seen before as well. Now, uh, Ellen, let's start with you in terms of the, both the customer demographic that you target and who's going on these luxury expedition cruises today, and, and maybe what percentage of your guests are maybe new to cruising. They haven't done other cruises, but the first thing they try is expedition cruising. Yeah, um, I think about I think the statistic is about 25% of Penang guests have never been on a cruise before. Um, and it's largely because we're going places that you can't go other ways, right? Or, or that are best explored by small ships. So some of the, the places we've mentioned, Antarctica, obviously, Greenland, or remote islands and New Guinea, or Solomon, Melanesia, all of those places. If you want to go there, the best experience is, is going to be on a small ship. Um, our demographic, it's it, at Penon, it's typically adults who have the time and the interest in, in doing what we're doing. Um, our guests on expeditions 
they usually would identify themselves as travelers, not tourists, um, probably not even cruisers. Um, but they're people who want to understand the world by engaging with it and interacting with it. Uh, we do welcome kids on board Panant, but um, most of our guests are, are adults. Right. And Tim M, the same question. I mean, what are the, the, the customer demographic you target for your cruises and, and you know, uh, what percentage of your guests are actually this is their first cruise? Yeah. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's quite a, a complicated sort of piece to put together with, with five different ships uh, and, and operating, you know, like the, the uh, Galapagos product has its own sort of unique set of demographics. And, and uh, it, it is, as uh, I, I mentioned, a little bit more of a, a multi-generational destination. Uh, you know, the fly cruise program, for example, uh, that, that we, we we're launching down in Antarctica, that, right. that has a slightly different demographic. It's designed to appeal to the, the more affluent traveler who doesn't necessarily have the, the two or three weeks over the, the holiday Christmas season. So that has its own sort of demographic. Um, as, a, as a general sort of broader statement, uh, we're probably in about that 25% uh, sort of uh, range as well in terms of new to cruising. Uh, you know, we uh, have, have a, an incredible global mix, which is, which is really nice. We have, you know, sales offices in Sydney and in, in Singapore for the Asia. We have the, the Germanic market uh, with, with offices for, for DAX. Uh, and then big sales offices in, in London and, and the US. So, you know, we, we definitely draw from a, a, a global source. And I think that's one of the really nice sort of elements of, of being part of, of, of Silver Seas. Once on board, you're, you're mixing with, uh, you know, I, I always used to, to, to say, that I, I never had a boring dinner on, on board because you're, you're yeah. always meeting someone from somewhere that, that they're successful. Whatever their success has come from, you know, they, they've been... Uh, they, they've been places, they've traveled, they're, they're looking to explore these unique parts of the world. Um, you know, I, I think we're probably at about a, a, a 63, if I'm not mistaken, uh, average age. But, you know, as Elena said, it's also like around the Christmas time, the polar trips, uh, you know, to Antarctica, they tend to draw. I, I wouldn't say that we have a lot of kids by any means, but, you know, that, that's when families tend to travel to these, these destinations. Um, but yeah, it's really a, a, a quite quite mixed bag depending on where you are. Uh, the the regional specific cruises get more attention to those those particular markets. Uh, but but it is yeah just an, an incredible large diversity. That's great. No, and it is it is actually bringing more cru people to cruising if especially if this is their first time. Uh, uh, Tim Birch, uh, uh, same question. I mean, you're you've only been out in the market for a few years now. Uh, but and also you 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 know or you, originally your owner is 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 based in Portugal, right? Uh, so so you you focused a lot on Europeans and obviously been marketing very heavily here in the U.S. in recent years. But who is your customer today, and 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 what are you trying to target? Well, we we really are targeting our first of all our demographics. I would have to say is about on average fifty five plus active, especially obviously in the polar regions. Um, but, you know, as far as any kids, we quite honestly don't have any kids under 12 years old, mm -hmm. uh, but we're really focusing in on, um, you know, the affluent traveler um, and especially in, in Europe, for sure. Um, we, we're getting, you know, our average age is about 65, 66, um, but we pretty much go after 55 and up in, especially in the polar regions. Yeah, well, you see, I, now I, I'm part of that market, so uh, you know, I I to say, I, I, I'm like, oh no, I can't be, but I, I am. But it is, it is active people too, though, because that's yes, for sure. We all got to get off these things and do the activities, and that's really one of the biggest things I always tell people. You have to, you can enjoy the sightseeing and just sit there in the front, in front of the bow and watch everything go by, but if you're really going to get something out of it, you got to go on the expeditions and get in the zodiacs and really get up close with nature. So that, that's a big thing. Now. Uh, final question. Uh, is there anything else uh, you want to tell our travel advisor viewers, uh, all of whom are focused on selling cruises and expedition cruises? I'm going to start with uh, you, Tim M. Uh, anything else you want to tell them? Um, no, I think we've, we've covered a, a lot of the, the sort of general concepts. Um, the, I suppose one of the, the final elements, and um, I, I don't say this with, with any disrespect, but yeah, I feel like having been in the industry for a long time is, is an incredible uh, value add. 
and what what I, I want to draw that analogy, you know, unfortunately we not unfortunately, fortunately, we are operating in incredibly remote parts of the world, you know, Antarctica is, is a difficult destination to operate in. And, you know, unfortunately, there, there were fatal accidents um, this this year in, in the in the region. And um, I, I think understanding that there has been an incredible uh, boost in the in the industry, you know, I think we talk about 108 percent compounded interest from 2019 to 2023 in the growth of the industry. Uh, I, I encourage advisors to to do their, their due diligence and make sure that the companies that they're sending uh, their clients on, you know, it, it's obviously a big financial commitment, but it's also, it, it's beyond that, you know, you're operating in, in these incredibly challenging environments. You want to know that the team that that's going there and, and, and is uh, putting forward these products is, is doing it, you know, they're, they're the environmental social governance concerns uh, that, that are important, you know, we want to be responsible travelers to these destinations, uh, but also that we have, you have the experience and the knowledge uh, to to handle the situations, be be safe, be uh, conscious travelers and operators, and and really focus on. Uh, I I don't think any of us are, are, on this panel would would want to see these destinations ruined through through irresponsible travel. And uh, you know I, I certainly noticed over the the my career uh, tightening of of concerns and regulations in some of these these markets. Um, and and the final sort of comment is. Yeah, and, and this is a generic answer, I would assume, for my panelists as well. The the average traveler will, will often say, oh, Antarctica is on my bucket list or, or, or something like that. I think it's worth acknowledging that, you know, the, the med will always be there uh, or, you know, sailing through Sydney or the Alaska, you know, the, the, the classic destinations are, are not changing as much, but the regulation and and the, the physical requirements for a traveler to operate in Antarctica, you know, you want to have your knees and your hips and you want to be able to participate. So what, what might be further down on a bucket list should, should really come to the forefront of your mind to, to do these destinations while you can and, and fill health and, and, uh, and, and be able to, to, to maximize not only your personal enjoyment, but uh, the, the destination themselves, you know, uh, so, since, I, I started, uh, you know, going down to Antarctica. I think there were probably six or eight uh, operators down there. Uh, I believe it's somewhere in the region of about sixty now that are operating down in Antarctica. So the 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 landscape is changing. You know, right. I'm not That's talking true. about it from a, a global warming perspective or anything, but the, the number of operators and the regulation around how we deliver those products uh, is is not going to get easier in the coming years. So I, I encourage travelers to to get down and, and capitalize on their own health and and the current state. And absolutely, and certainly the the last few years of pandemic has convinced a lot of travelers that they always thought about that was one of their bucket lists, uh, and that's why there's been this sort of newfound popularity of going down to Antarctica. Uh, Tim Birch, uh, anything else you want to tell our uh, travel advisor viewers about Atlas Ocean and about expedition cruising? Well, first of all, I. I believe, well, we can't survive without our travel advisor support. That's at the end of the day, we rely on, on travel advisors to make us successful. Number two is I think they just need to think out of the box. You know, I talked to so many travel advisors that say, oh, I just, I, I don't know anything about Antarctica. I don't know anything about the Arctic, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know what? Just, you know, do your due diligence and, and talk to your client about it. But it, it's, uh, you know, just think out of the box at the end of the day. Um, you know, we all provide a great product for sure. Um, but it, you know, for sure, for us, we rely so much on our travel advisors to to make, make us successful. And uh, that's, that would be my advice. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Ellen, you close it out if you could. Uh, tell us uh, anything else you want to tell our travel advisors about Panon today and also about expedition cruising. Yeah, well, I mean, thank you for attending to, to those uh, travel advisor partners who who are listening to the panel. I think, um, you know, Tim Am's kind of sobering comments about Antarctica are true. Uh, you know, it's something to to everyone to do their homework for. And um, I earlier I said, you know, go on an expedition so you understand it. And I think that really will inform you. You know, you'll know to ask questions about IATO, um, you know, about how companies, which companies are, um, what what the the places that you're spending your money with and your time with 
are doing to make sure that these places are protected. We didn't really get into the sustainability piece on this panel, but I think it's a huge part of the conversation. I'm sure all of our um, companies have webinars galore about this, um, but it's a big piece of the conversation and it's something that people think about when they book expedition. So I do also encourage people to understand that piece of who they're offering and not just because it's the responsible thing to do, but it's also a really good sales tool. So if your client wants to go to Antarctica, you know, you can offer put on and say, by the way, this you know, this is a zero impact wastewater vessel. It's hybrid electric, right? And so that'll make, that'll help you kind of greases the wheel to put down the deposit, right? You can match your traveler at their values by being informed about the sustainability piece. Um, that's one thing I would say. And the other one is, you know, we want to hear from you. There is so much going on in this market. It's so fast paced. There's a lot going on at Penang. Um, you know, it feels like there's a press release every two weeks. Uh, Le Penon is now a Relay and Chateau property. There's so much happening and we want you to be part of the conversation. So please, you know, be in touch with our business development team. There's always more coming down the pike um, and we want to make sure that that you're informed and we, we want to um, have you on our radar. So that would be, and thank you for your support, of course. Well, I want to thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Tim and Tim. Uh, for, for being part of this panel. It's a great panel. I love expedition cruising. It's, it's such a, I discovered it finally, uh, actually right after pandemic. And my first one was a Galapagos. And then I followed up with, uh, as I said, three uh, Antarctic cruises. And then I just got off an Arctic cruise. So uh, I've been able to do a lot of great cruising and there's still more to do in other parts of the world. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Uh, and I want to urge all of our viewers here, all of your travel advisors here to, you can go now to the virtual floor uh, of our expedition floor and talk to these companies, uh, their sales teams, and uh, learn more, even more about uh, their products and services. And it's really such a great category to sell for your clients. And it's really something that's really growing right now. And as you, you know, we, we have, we've seen so many more operators coming into the market, uh, really good ones too. And, and the, these folks here are kind of on the luxury and premium side of it. Uh, and that is something that's growing as well. But again, uh, thank you all for, for being with us today. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm James Schillinglaw for Virtual Roadshows and Insider Travel Report.